have Siciliana for A. Mm -hmm. So transcribe for bass. You, uh, you can do it on shallow really, but I think it's oh, over the shallow. No, I haven't. Just, just Real? so no for A. Uh, Gabriel for A. Uh, it's real romantic. Uh, oh, uh, it, oh it's, yeah. It's the thing that, that you hear on uh, WFIU that uh, uh, George Walker oh, does. Oh, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. oh, oh. right, right, right. And we do it. Uh, I've done it on trombone. It's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. So, and it's transcribed for string bass, so you could read it off of that. It's in the library. And mm. uh, really, really nice. I guess I'd work with organ. Yeah, I do have a lot of real sonatas my fellow people last night. So. The Second International Brass Congress was held at Indiana University in June 1984 and was attended by over 1,300 enthusiastic brass performers, students, and teachers. My name is Dee Stewart, and I would like to share with you a portion of a panel discussion that was held on the subject of brass pedagogy. The participants were very illustrious musicians, and the comments of Arnold Jacobs will be featured here. The discussion was attended by an extremely interested audience and was chaired by one of our most productive teachers, the great French horn player, Philip Farkas. Although I don't know what a chairman really does, uh, to, uh, to be surrounded by four of the finest teachers who ever lived, the best teachers, the greatest in the world. And I'm, I'm very thrilled to be just in the middle of this group. Uh, I'd like to introduce each of them to you before we start. Over here, Arnold Jacobs, who was my colleague in the Chicago Symphony for 13, 14 years. <laughs> Dennis Wick from England, who you all know by name. Freudus Wecker. Freudus is an old friend and uh, even uh, helped out here at Indiana University during a, a period of illness on my part and uh, got to know her students here and they all love her as you will. And then Armando Gatala. <laughs> Had I not left the Boston Symphony when I did, I would have been a colleague of Armando's, but I left a few years before he came into the Boston Symphony. But we know each other from many years of collaboration and workshops. Arnold? Arnold. All right, surely. Well, I have uh, maybe some rather peculiar ideas about teaching, but they may be a little different. But uh, for instance, I like instrumentation to augment the human intellect, not to replace it, but simply to augment it. Um, human brain's a magnificent tool. People tend to think in different ways, though. They have different forms of excellence. One person may think just beautifully in terms of color, spaciousness, and uh, the perspectives that are so valuable in art. My wife is a fine artist, and uh, she draws so beautifully. I remember making a painting when I was in school, and the teacher said, for heaven's sakes, what is this? And I said, it's a lilac bush, but it's autumn. In other words, there was really nothing on it. And uh, I... <laughs> I just don't think very well in terms of color and space, but I think very well in terms of recall of sound, recognition of uh, sound, color of sound. I recognize a great deal about that. There are people that I know that don't do this so well. They think beautifully in terms of logic. I think they found through psychological testing that people have abilities in their brain that may not be developed, but have the potential of development. In other words, the person I have in mind, one former student of mine, who came to me at a time when I was very much interested in the psychology of function, physical function, and thoughts that tend to bring about motor responses and how we use them in music, this young man would have qualified to being tone deaf. In other words, I would sing a note he could not sing the note. In other words, if I am bomb, most of you could immediately respond to that and reproduce that pitch in whatever octave you liked. He could not do that. I would uh, test him in every way that I could in terms of recall, 
and recognition, and he qualified in most respects and that he was tone deaf. Finally, I got him to think back to his childhood years in school, and he finally came up with a crazy little tune, something like, oh, I think it was, oh, it ain't gonna rain no more, it ain't gonna rain no more, how oh, the heck can I wash my neck if it ain't gonna rain no more? It was a very silly little thing that he had learned as a child. And he sang it in tune, he, all the intervals, everything was fine. It indicated to me that somewhere in that brain there was the ability to have recall of pitch and recognition. In other words, there was something interfering, something interfering with this. We speak of instrumentation. At that time, I was interested in the augmenting of uh, our abilities by bringing more than one sense to bear on a subject. I started this student with the aid of a con, strobicon, a 12-window job, a tape recorder, and a piano. And we immediately put the instrument down for a while, and we started just a recognition of program of um, watching a wheel and hearing a pitch at the same time. When the wheel stopped, we knew that there was an intonation factor. I didn't ask the student to repeat the pitch after me. I just had him listen in silence, but to have recall in his head, start a pattern of recognition. We used a tape recorder so that afterwards, whatever pitches were being recorded were actually being played back in tape, and they could be, again, observed through the sense of sight, which is one of our very powerful learning senses we immediately started this program of developing the regions of the brain that have to do with recall of pitch. We began to make very slow progress, but there was definite progress, enough to warrant some uh, indication that this was a proper route to go. And I admit, we used instrumentation in the beginning to augment his senses, because when he would try to think and recall, he would set up a pattern of motor function, but he would lose in the brain what he was trying to actually accomplish his pitch. When you want to have, if you have a student, or if you have problems in this manner, if you retain in the brain, if somebody sings a note or plays a note, you have to be able to retain that note in your brain, and then you imitate it. You can't let it go from the brain, or there's nothing to imitate. When you set up the physical, physical patterns of function and that sound has disappeared from the brain, you will actually be unable to reproduce that note. And it's always, it has to be a retention in the brain, and you develop this retention by simply challenging the brain. If a person can't walk, he has to learn to crawl first, but he goes from crawling to walking to running. So we have to start at the level a student can cope with. But by doing that, the young man I have in mind is in one of the professional symphony orchestras today. He has a fine career in music with a fine recognition and recall of sound, which shows that it can be done. I feel very strongly when we teach, we're dealing with a human being. Now, we have a student come into the studio and play for us. Uh, the teacher has to become sensitive to what the student is like, what he thinks, not just we, we must have a message that we impart to a student, but we must know can he receive the message. In other words, is there a language difficulty? Is there a factor that the student thinks along different lines, maybe very intelligent more so than the teacher, but cannot comprehend because he is not used to the verbalizations. He may not used, be used to the patterns. There are multiple tools that we use to establish two-way communications with students. What I'm very interested in is the fact that when we deal with brass players, we're dealing with a phenomena that's quite different from, uh, you might say, the musician is going to study cello or piano. When the piano is sent out from the factory, the factory sends out an instrument that has built-in pitch vibration. It has built-in resonance. It requires a motor function. Somebody must provide motor activity or that pitch vibration cannot be achieved. Now, I have great respect for pianists. My mother was a marvelous pianist. I love the instrument. It's tremendously difficult, requires tremendous development and ability on the part of the human playing the piano. So when I say this, it's not a put down, but you can run a cat down the piano keyboard and you will get sounds. In other words, it may not be great music, but nevertheless, <laughs> the, the factory has sent out an instrument that, that has already been set up in terms of pitch vibration and resonance, and it requires motor function from then on. We go to the opposite end, the human voice, you have in the person, under control of the nervous system, you have the motor functions, you have pitch vibration based on resonance, you have uh, based on the vocal cord activity, and you have resonance based on the body chambers where air is going to be re resonated and reflected. 
All three are part of the human being. The brass player gets from the factory an instrument that has resonance built in but does not have pitch vibration built in or motor function. In other words, out of three basic requirements for sound, pitch vibration, resonance, motor function, only you have resonance built in with its peculiar laws into the brass instrument. That means the player must provide the motor activity. This is done through the breath. He has pitch vibration, which is done through the vibration of the embouchure. He has resonance according to the partials. The acoustics of the instrument are quite different than the other instruments involved. It's primarily sympathetic resonance. In the piano, you have what we call forced resonance. You have one soundboard that resonates all frequencies. You must alter the brass instrument to resonate all frequencies. It has its partial laws that must be obeyed. To bring this into being as function, then, the brass player has to be handled so that the dominance in his learning is based on the ability to have recall and conceptual thoughts of sound. In other words, there has to be the ability for the vocal cord activity to leave the vocal cords and go to the vocal cords of the trumpet, the embouchure. It has to vibrate according to certain pitch frequencies. Now, this is done by activity in the brain going down the nerves to reflex activity that is built up in the tissues in the lip. And this encouragement, right from the very first start, you take a young child coming in for a lesson. What I do, in, in a pedagogical sense, so I'll take a youngster, when he comes to my studio, I consider him an elementary artist, extremely elementary, but he is still in an art form what I do, I take his trumpet and his mouthpiece and I play one note and I make him listen to one note. I make him try to absorb the sound of that. I may play it as poorly as I can, make a really atrocious sound, then I try to play it to the best of my very limited ability on trumpet to have a very good sound. So the discrimination is started up very early. I encourage the student to study the sound because he wants to study the instrument. I want him to study the sounds of the instrument so the dominance is not the physical aspect of the trumpet, but the musical aspect of the trumpet, or horn, or trombone, or tuba, as a tonal phenomena. So as he's learning to create sound, he is learning to play the instrument. The human being will want to know how to proceed because in all the phenomena of life outside of the human body, you will find that analyses, learning what to do, follow directions, <clears throat> The ability to proceed intelligently is to know what you're doing. You can never know what you're doing with your own body. You can know what you want the body to accomplish by throwing a ball or walking or talking or eating or using your body for the various things in life. But the intellect of a human being is to cope with life around you, not life within you. By that I mean if you analyze your thoughts, you'll find they are primarily based on the ability to control yourself in relationship to your external environment. That's to people and to whatever you're trying to accomplish through the day. But how much control do you have over peristalsis, over homeostasis, over the alkali and acid relationships in the body? You have other levels of the brain that take care of the body and allow it to function according to what you want to do when you want to throw a ball or whatever you're trying to accomplish with your body or walk or talk. The thinking level of the brain at that time is free to cope with the other phenomena of life around you. Now, when we turn inward, and we have to use our bodies, we'll say, for athletics, for dancing, for athletic procedures, or for playing musical instruments, there are certain laws that you have to follow. When they say paralysis by analysis, this is a very true statement. You cannot use the tremendous ability of the human brain to analyze, to analyze yourself based on the channels of information that come up from your body to the thinking levels of the brain. There is just no way you can do this. You have sensory nerves, in other words, that will carry information from outside of your body to the brain. The sensors will be the sense of sight, powerful, powerful tool. Sense of sound, tremendously powerful tool. Sense of touch, the sense of smell, sense of taste. There are all sorts of sensors that will receive information and transmit it from without to within, to the brain. To influence the external environment, you do it on a completely altered basis. The external environment, you must use psychomotor activity. In other words, to do anything, if I touch this microphone, I use motor systems. There's feedback that comes through the sensory, sensory system. We'll always be aware through proprioception of a position of the arm or the hand. 
we'll, we'll get some information back, but the primary functions are motor functions, not sensory. When we play a brass instrument, we are using primarily motor activity. There is a component of sensory feedback, but to communicate to somebody else, there has to be psychomotor activity. Now what this means, as I talk to you, I am not aware of laryngeal or pharyngeal or lingual or labial activity or respiratory activity. I'm aware of my message. There's a flow of words. Tremendously complex things are happening in my body for, for me to deliver information to you. I don't know from nothing about that. What I've learned about this, I've learned by studying other bodies, not my own. In other words, the ability to analyze yourself is extremely limited. You can analyze your products, what you're trying to accomplish in life. You can analyze through certain parts of your anatomy where there's more feedback, like in the fingers, proprioception. We have a nervous system that tells us what's happening in this particular region of our anatomy. You don't have this in your embouchure. In other words, the functions of the embouchure are based primarily on the seventh cranial nerve carrying messages, just like a wiring hookup from a tape recorder. We, we have a message that comes from a computer activity to the lip where you have developed reflex responses to stimulus. In other words, you don't control the lips, you control the message. In controlling the message, you have controlled the embouchure. The embouchure is not made up of, of a simple muscular group. It is not the orbicularis auris. It's made up of many groups that feed in, that cause the lip to be able to retract, to protract, to elevate, to depress, to vibrate, in other words, at different frequencies. And they re this is something that is so enormously complex, the only hope of success is to find the simple answer. The lip must vibrate. That means it has to be motivated to create sound. In taking a young student, I start them off by demonstrating sound. <clears throat> they want to know how you do it. I don't answer that. I say, try to sound this way. Buzz your lip. I will say that. I let them buzz on the mouthpiece. I take the mouthpiece and just make horrible sounds, make musical sounds, do anything they want with it, but they start a pattern of causation, of buzz. Then I ask them to take their trumpet home and play for their father and try to demonstrate what Mr. Jacob sounded like on his trumpet and his mouthpiece. Very quickly, a pattern begins to form, not of just playing a note, but of sounding a certain way. This is important to the human brain. In other words, the brain of the artist is one, it's like a storyteller, like that of an actor. You have a message for somebody in the audience, and the brain should not be tremendously involved in the piece of brass. It should be tremendously involved in the music you're going to produce with it. That means you have to develop a conditioning in a player. I prefer that the young player is conditioned in the phenomena of sound and phrase and emotions of music, rhythms of music, but I want him expert in music, not in trumpet, not in tuba. I want him expert in the sounds of the instruments. This little psychological twist is very important because so many of the people want to learn the instrument in order to play the music. I want them to learn the music, and while they're learning the music, they're learning their instrument. I put the dominance on very easy music that can be coped with without technical knowledge and so forth, but I want the heavy question to be what the audience is going to hear from this instrument, not the methodology of producing it. They have to do this because of the enormous power of the human brain to acquire information. And you deal with young students, everybody knows the phenomena of the young child, the tremendous ability to learn. In other words, the ability of the brain to gather information is far greater than to impart information. And here we have this tremendous ability suddenly being channeled into an art form. Well, an art form is an, a form of communication. Sure, you have to learn about the uh, communication. Listen, I'm probably using up much too much time here. That's very interesting. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I could talk on this subject probably for hours to come. I just want to, I'll close this simply by stating that uh, as far as I'm concerned in a pedagogical sense, I would like very much that the uh, stress comes to a very non-technical way of teaching so that the teacher may understand psychophysiology or anything involved in terms of the human function, but as a player, he becomes a storyteller himself. As a guidance, uh, in guidance to others, the guidance is dominantly that of music. 
That includes qualities of tone, it includes emotions, it includes rhythms, it includes uh, excitement, all sorts of things that are involved in our particular art form. I would like a heavy involvement of that and a lesser involvement in the, what will I say, the uh, study of meat, the study of tissue function. And I think with that, I'll, I'll let somebody else take the floor. <laughs> I didn't want to stop Arnold because I was getting such a good lesson. I enjoyed it very much. But uh, let's hear from Dennis Wick now. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, it seems to me that teaching is really, as so many of pe people here have said so very well, uh, a, a process of communication. First of all, the player does what he does. Then he tells his student what he thinks he does. Then the student hears what he thought the teacher said, and then he thinks he does what he thought the teacher said that he thought he did. <laughs> the popularity of Arnold Jacobs' philosophy seemed to indicate more study would be of interest. Let us turn now to an informal symposium on Arnold Jacobs' methods led by Dr. Sheldon Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner is a multifaceted individual. He teaches graduate psychology, is a lawyer, as well as a fine horn player. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, psychology and um, wind playing, probably brass playing. Uh, how many of you are brass players? Okay. Uh, I'm uh, a brass player for 30 years. And uh, I teach psychology, and I teach the psychology of learning. And learning has to do with acquiring and changing behavior. Now, uh, we psychologists are very bold in that regard, and we regard behavior as uh, anything uh, that you can describe, anything you can feel, or anything you can observe anybody else, or anybody else can observe you doing. What this really is, is a graduate course in psychology as applied to a very specialized area of music in 15 minutes. <laughs> now, <clears throat> it really isn't too difficult if I do my job right, because there's nothing terribly complicated about concepts if they're simply presented and so I hope that I'll be able to do that. And insofar as I'm not understandable, you'll tell me. We have to have, however, some common ground in order to start. Is there anybody here who thinks their brains are in their lips? <laughs> We're in business. OK. I, I would like to answer in the course of all of this, and especially with your help, three questions. Why is most brass playing taught wrong? Okay. And, and you see, I don't make my living <laughs> playing brass, so, you know, nobody can fire me. <laughs> and at the most profound level that I can ask the question or it can be answered, how do people learn to make music on a brass instrument? That's number two. And number three, what do I have to do to play as easily and confident, confidently as Jake? Basically speaking, all of the things which make us the way we are are a reflection of what happens to us, us, and the consequences. Very simply put, 
for we psychologists and we psychologist brass players, and we are all psychologists because everybody deals with psychology all of their lives. So we are all psychologists today. Okay. The world is a stimulus complex. Everything is a stimulus. Okay. And when you're in that stimulus complex, something happens, you respond to something, and if it's and if the consequences are good, you play a tone, you see a, a note on a page and you play a tone and you say to yourself, wonderful, then you will subconsciously make an effort to reproduce that tone in that situation. If the opposite happens, it's a horrible tone. Or somebody says to you, my God, if that's the best you can do, stop playing. Well, you will make an effort not to do that again. We develop habits. What is a habit? Basically speaking, a habit is the response that we have to a particular situation. You see a printed C, and you do something, and a pitch comes out that we all except as a C in terms of that printed C. Now, there is a very small group of behaviors that we have, responses that we have, that are not the reflection of conditioning. And those are reflexes. Uh, those are automatic. Most of what we do in the world that is meaningful is a reflection of a habit that has taken on such potency that it becomes reflexive or, or near, near reflexive. That is to say, you don't have to think about it, you just do it. These are the basic systems you come in with and everything else is acquired. And all of these habits that are acquired, the really important ones, come to have the quality of being automatic, reflexive. You don't have to think about them. They just kick in in situations and whether you like them or you don't. We as human beings have a little bit of an edge on that system. And that is that we are, to a, a limited extent, and those of you who are fond of free will may be disappointed, a very limited extent, we are participants. We are participatory in what we do. We can reflect on what's happened and we can take some steps to change things. Why is most brass teaching done wrong? If you have a fine player, what can he teach you, he or she? The male pronoun serves for the female gender as well and the reverse. What can that person teach you? Well, they can teach you by demonstration great playing in terms of great products. Can they teach you about conditioning, especially if they know nothing about it? No. Well, what is it they're going to show you then? Most people can show you things that are physical. There are very few people who can show you magic. So there is a great effort to try to explain in terms of physical phenomena what the brass player experiences when he plays, he or she plays. And this is what they attempt to convey to the student. And what caps it and makes it work as far as the musicianship goes, is they play. And so what you get is the benefit of great products and the hinderment of misinformation. Uh, we learned from uh, Jake uh, that the key is wind and song. Now what does that mean? Well, if you have no brains singing with Sutherland one time and he reached around and he grabbed her stomach. 
He was trying to figure out, and this was a world-class professional, what in the world she was doing for breath support. He didn't know. And yet he was able to sing very well himself. Uh, we learned from uh, Jake uh, that the key is wind and song. Now what does that mean? Well, 